Happy Friday and welcome to Meet the Press Now. I'm Chuck Todd and for the second time in three days, Hurricane Ian has made landfall in the United States, slamming into South Carolina less than two hours ago. This time as a category one storm. The sustained winds were just 85 miles per hour, but still a strong hurricane. Coastal communities are bracing for a storm surge of four to seven feet, and that's where it makes this hurricane stronger than the average Category 1. The wind speeds may be manageable. It's this storm surge that and massiveness that makes it so difficult. You're looking at the live pictures here now from Myrtle Beach. The center of the storm came ashore pretty much right between Myrtle Beach and Charleston. We're going to speak with Charleston's mayor and the Myrtle Beach emergency manager in just a moment. As Ian batters the Carolinas, we're getting new pictures from Florida's Gulf Coast, where folks are beginning the process of cleaning up in the light of day after Ian made landfall there about 48 hours ago as one of the most powerful and deadly storms ever to hit the state. It's also expected to be one of the most expensive storms ever to hit Florida. These aerials have just come into us from Lee County. That is where Fort Myers is. It's one of the hardest hit areas, and it gives you a sense of the total devastation in this region. Wiped out a, a lot of, of buildings that maybe, frankly, weren't up to code. This is also the scene on the ground in Fort Myers, Florida. Officials say as many as 21 deaths have been reported so far statewide. Although they caution those numbers could fluctuate, nearly 2 million customers are still without power. And by the way, it's in these days afterward that sometimes you, you, you see accidental deaths, whether it's from bad management of generators or water issues. Rescue teams in Florida have so far responded to more than 3,000 homes, with officials saying they've conducted 700 rescues. Here's some Coast Guard video of its teams making aerial rescues on Sanibel Island. After the storm completely de destroyed the area's only connection to the mainland. In a briefing this morning, uh, this afternoon in Fort Myers, Governor Ron DeSantis warned of a long recovery ahead for residents devastated by this storm. Just a few moments later, President Biden addressed the devastation himself, vowing to offer whatever resources are needed to help the states rebuild. It's not just a crisis for Florida. This is an American crisis. We're all in this together. We're just beginning to see the scale of that destruction. It's likely to rank among the worst of the nations and the worst in the nation's history. You have all seen, the tele seen on television, homes and property wiped out. It's going to take months, years to rebuild. And our hearts go out to all those folks whose lives have been absolutely devastated by this storm. Shaquille Brewster is on the ground in Charleston, South Carolina. So, Chuck, Charleston, I know, just had flooding issues uh, uh, last year. So, obviously, a big concern is going to be a storm surge. How's the city holding up? That's exactly right. And, you know, when you talk to residents, when our team has been talking with people preparing for this storm, many of them knew exactly what to do. They knew to clear out the storm drains. They knew where to put the sandbags because this is an area that is used to flooding. And then you had that rain. And that's, you know, the eye of the, uh, of the hurricane did not hit Charleston. It hit about 60 miles north of Charleston. But that, mean, that, that impact was still there for this city. This is a city that saw wind gusts of up to 70 miles an hour. That saw about seven inches of rain, more than seven inches of rain, unofficial totals uh, over the past 24 hours. And currently, at last check, there are about 90,000 people in this area without power. So this city definitely felt the effects of this hurricane. They got the tropical storm effects of it. But uh, what you're seeing along the coast, if you go up the South Carolina coast, that's where you see the biggest impacts. I'm thinking of Pauley Island, where an entire pier collapsed. You had the police department there saying that the flooding that they were receiving receiving uh, that they received uh, was catastrophic. Now, we know that most of that flooding is starting to recede right now in the downtown Charleston area. We're also seeing some of those waters come down. But you're getting an idea, although South Carolina didn't get anything close to what you saw out of Florida, uh, it was definitely a major impact when it hit that, when that category storm, one storm hit the coast of South Carolina. And Shaq, wait, look, you were in Florida yesterday. You're seeing Ian, you saw Ian leave the state of Florida. Now you had to go to Charleston to watch it come back. Um, compare and contrast. Yeah. 
You know, it's at, where I was in Florida, I was in Jacksonville. So there it was about 100 miles. The eye of the storm was about 100 miles uh, off the, away from Jacksonville. But you still got the outer bands. And, you know, I think one thing that you continue to hear from meteorologists is despite you being far from the actual eye of the storm, the power of the storm, because of how wide it is, the size that it takes up, it, uh, it impacts a lot of people. So the flooding concern that we were uh, hearing about in Jacksonville, uh, while it didn't come true in terms of the levels that they were concerned about, there was flo flooding, there was significant rain, and that's a similar uh, idea and a similar concern that you're hearing in the Charleston area, that it's dumping so much rain on these areas, the ground is so saturated, so although the wind speed might not be what you see in the southwest part, southwestern part of Florida, it still has that water impact, it still leads to down trees, down power lines, and a large impact. I think the size of this storm uh, is really something that is so notable about uh, Hurricane Ian. Yeah, that, that, that's for sure. Uh, Shaquille Brewster uh, in Charleston Forest. Shaq, thank you. And I'm joined now by the mayor of Charleston, John Tecklenburg. And Mr. Mayor, I know you dealt with these floods last year, these tidal floods. Um, obviously, the concern with this storm is the fact that it seems the storm surge and the water's in some ways more damaging than the wind. Uh, how's the city holding up, and, and do you think you can avoid major flooding issues? Well, thank you, Chuck. I, I think we held up well. We were well prepared, and I believe we're a very resilient city in a way we've had practice now for about yeah. eight years in a row with storms every year, which uh, belies the whole story about impact from climate change and extreme weather becoming a more common uh, occurrence uh, here in Charleston and around the world and doing those things that are needed to protect ourselves uh, from these impact from climate change. You know, each storm these days gives us an idea. Oh, we didn't mitigate for that. Oh, we didn't mitigate for that. What are you seeing in this storm that tells you, okay, we were ready for this, but it turns out we've got to do more here to be ready for a storm like this next time? Well, well, we know, Chuck, there's more for us to do because you just can't uh, put in place all of these mitigation measures, this infrastructure in an instant. It, ta it does take some time. We've got lots of projects on the way, including the reinforcement and heightening elevation of our sea battery wall, uh, which uh, isn't quite finished yet. And so we were afraid with uh, a combination of surge mm -hmm. and high tide today that it would be breached once again like it was in a, a few hurricanes recently. But it was not, thankfully, given the fact that Ian stayed a little offshore. Right. And in fact, we ended up getting the counterclockwise motion pushing out a little bit. So rather than a four to seven foot surge in Charleston Harbor, I think it was only about one to two feet. So that was a a blessing for us. That being said, we had a lot of water in the city today. Mm -hmm. We had a ton of rain. We we had tidal impacts, and uh, we closed 41 streets. We had trees down, uh, but we're already cleaning up and taking care of those things. And we're going to be back in business Monday, and welcome you to come visit. Uh, well, it's one of the great cities to visit. Let me ask you this: How many in your city? How many residents and businesses do have flood insurance, and how many don't? Exact numbers, I'll be honest, I don't have on top of my head, but about uh, half of our uh, city is in a floodplain or eligible for uh, federal flood insurance. We encourage all of our uh, citizens who are eligible to uh, take it out because uh, it's, a, it's a good protection. To Do you have think we country. should figure out a way to make that mandatory? I mean, at some point, you know, there's got to be, a, you, you know, you can't expect taxpayers to bail out people that don't buy insurance that they could have. Well, yeah, it's subsidized, of course, the whole program by the federal government. Um, but as it, as prices have been going up, um, it, it's hard to tell folks who are on fixed income um, and and maybe don't have any mortgage where they're required to have the flood insurance to, to force them to do it. We certainly recommend it. We try to help people get it, but um, it's it's not something we can we can require of folks to do. And finally, uh, state resources, federal resources. Are you getting everything you need? What more would you like? 
Well, we are, and we were in direct communications both with the state house, with the governor, and the White House called today. Um, everybody's been as cordial as possible and willing to help. Um, in a way, I feel like Charleston um, uh, dodged a little bit of a bullet today, not to say we don't have impacts and cleanup to do, but as I mentioned, we were prepared, we're pretty resilient, and uh, we're, we're um, cleaning up and going to be back in business in, in no time. Um, my heart goes out, um, as you've been showing these images of folks down in Florida, yeah. and I agree with the president, this is a national crisis, and all Americans should come together and help in any way they can uh, with, the, with the repairs and yeah. renovations and um, help down to our, our neighbors in Florida. Climate change doesn't know a political party, and it doesn't know a state border. Anyway, uh, Mayor Tecklenburg, uh, good to have you on, and uh, I'm glad to know that Charleston will be open uh, and ready for business next week. Thank you, sir. Let me uh, you, move on Thank to the you. emergency manager uh, for Myrtle Beach, South Carolina. That's Travis Gladke. Uh, uh, Mr. Gladke, I want to start with this. Tell me, how's the island holding up? I know this thing basically came in between. Charleston feels like it dodged a bullet. How would you describe things in Myrtle Beach? You know what? I think we held up pretty well. Um, our bad luck was that high tide was at 11 a.m. this morning, and that's really when the storm surge started coming in. Um, we had reports of uh, coastal storm surge as high as six feet. Uh, when you mix that with high tide, um, just some bad luck. We know that there's flooding, but those areas uh, along the coast are, um, we identified them early on to know that uh, they were uh, prone to flooding. Right. Um, so I think we made our best preparations and mitigation possible. You know, you've done some new mitigation. I'm curious what, what held up and what really pleased you that it held up? Well, we uh, initiated a mass notification system uh, roughly three weeks ago. Um, we were able to use it uh, throughout this storm. Uh, we shut down the beach on Thursday and Friday. Uh, we notified everyone. Um, we've also been working with uh, uh, public works to make sure that uh, the drainage systems are operating properly. Um, they're working around the clock. Uh, our utility companies, um, they had to pull the trucks off due to the high winds, but uh, as soon as it's safe for them to go back out, we feel pretty confident we can get people's uh, electric and gas put back on. You've had a lot of new residents move to Myrtle Beach during the pandemic. A lot of people moved north to south, right? Finding new places to live, work remote. These are people that have never prepared for a storm. You know, you could have people like myself who grew up in Florida. You sort of, you know the drill. You have people that don't know the drill. How concerned were you about that? And how well did these new residents uh, 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 follow orders, if you will? Yeah, it's certainly a concern. You know, I'm from Massachusetts. I mean, we have people from all over. Um, but, you know, I think that with us doing our community outreach and our public education, um, that's really been a priority for our emergency management division um, and all of our uh, public safety departments to get out there. Um, we started in March with hurricane preparedness activities. We've been going strong um, since then, trying to educate and inform people as much as possible. I think we've done a pretty good job. You know, a Category 1 storm doesn't scare many people. I was telling my own staff, oh, geez, Category 1 in Miami. But the storm surge is something that I think people don't necessarily respect when it's a Category 1, perhaps, as much as they do as Category 4. Uh, are you, that had to be another concern you had about maybe residents not fully appreciating the force of this storm surge. Yeah, no, I agree. Um, you know, we had the police department and our uh, water rescue personnel out there. Um, before the beginning of the storm, making sure that the beach was cleared, making sure that, uh, you know, buildings were, were you know, uh, cleared as much as possible from mm -hmm. the population that were along the coast. Um, so we were out there, you know, trying to prevent it and mitigate the circumstances as much as possible. It, the evac you didn't have a mandatory evacuation order. Was that a debate? Oh, sir, yeah, all, all week long we debated it. Um, we certainly encouraged it uh, throughout the week, even if, you know, yeah. we originally thought it was going to be, a, you know, a tropical storm. Um, when it hit the hurricane, we had some real strong debates back and forth. The decision was made not to do any sort of mandatory evacuation. I think for the most part, um, the areas held up well. Um, like I said, we've had areas that we knew were prone to flooding. Right. Um, we tried our best to properly, you know, inform the people you know, maybe evacuation is the best for you. Um, but, yeah, ultimately, we did not make any sort of mandatory evacuation. All right. Travis Gladke, the emergency manager for Myrtle Beach. Mr. Gladke, I'm glad to know 
seems as if the worst may be behind you. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. All right, let's turn now to the cleanup in Florida. That's where we find Blaine Alexander. She's in Fort Myers, and this is probably the heart as a... Uh, you know, Blaine, I had Craig Fugate. He's going to be on the show later. I had him on my podcast today. He was the emergency manager for FEMA and Florida. And he said, you know, what Andrew did to Miami and just changing it forever is what he thinks just happened to Fort, what Ian has done to Fort Myers. Yeah. And I think that's just from what I've seen here, Chuck, I do think that that's a fair assessment. You know, what we're looking at right now, this used to be a marina. This used to be a popular place where people would come, rent boats, rent paddle boats, and go out and enjoy a whole lot of water life. And this whole strip is now no, non-existent. That's that's the, the, the brunt of it. I spoke with a gentleman who owns this place here behind me. Uh, he told me that, quite frankly, he, some other people, just did not expect it to be this bad, didn't expect it to be this powerful. They tried their best to secure the boats they had, secure the kayaks, but you can see what it's done to this building, and you can't see it because it's off camera, Chuck, but really, a lot of the boats that were over here to my right in the water are now completely on the other side, over to my left. They're in streets. They're up against, uh, you know, branches and things over that way, and that's what we're seeing all up and down this coastline. One thing that we have been seeing is a lot of people coming and seeing this damage for the very first time, Chuck, yeah. and we can look at pictures, you can look at aerials, you can look at news reports, but there's really nothing that compares to somebody walking up seeing the place that they called home or the place that brought in their livelihood and seeing it destroyed for the very first time. Unfortunately, that's a lot of what we're seeing today. I do want to make the point, and I think it's important to mention, though, even though there are a lot of people who are surveying the damage, there is a lot of urgency still. There's still a lot of search and rescue going mm -hmm. on. The emergency, this kind of race against time, isn't over just because the storm has blown through. Sanibel Island is a perfect example of that. You know, where we're standing right now, every now and then, we hear choppers fly overhead. We hear military choppers flying over that way towards Sanibel Island. That's because the one road in and out, as you know, has been washed away. It's not passable. The only way to get there is by chopper or by boat. What they're doing is they're sending search and rescue teams over there. Officials say that they're dropping people there. They're literally knocking door by door, checking to see if there are people there. Right. And unfortunately, Chuck, they say as they continue to clear those houses, they do expect to see the death toll go up as they kind of get the full extent of what they're looking at. You know, Blaine, when, do you, when will authorities feel like they have an idea of how many people are unaccounted for and, and you know, where they can sort of target their search and rescue efforts? And then when does this only become recovery? You know, right now, they still say it's search and rescue. They So there are still people who are over there who are just uh, trapped and essentially trying to, uh, trying to get out. Unfortunately, in a briefing earlier this morning, uh, one official did say they've had divers go in and look in homes and, uh, you know, see what they believe to be human remains. And so they just can't get to them right now. That's when we're going to start to see that death toll increase, Chuck, as they get access to those places. And you've taken a look at the, the devastation are you seeing a clear pattern of, of what buildings survived and what didn't? You know, what we're seeing right here, uh, really it looks like anything that's facing that way, which is where the storm blew through, was, was sheared. There's, you know, there's, that's kind of the, that's the brunt of it. There's a high rise, not, you can see it right over there. There's damage there, certainly. Uh, we know there's damage, but it's still standing. There were people who kind of rode out the storm in high rises like that and other uh, kind of places mm -hmm. that they could find. I've got to say what's interesting, we've really been all over the state of Florida. We started in Jacksonville, drove to Orlando, and then drove down here to Fort Myers. One thing that I am noticing is that you can see where the real devastation starts. As you're kind of driving down the highway, you see trees in the road. You see on ramps and off ramps that are still flooded, and you see destruction as you start to get closer. I think what's important to point out, though, is that resources are still missing here. You know, we're more than 80 degrees uh, here in, in Fort Myers. There's no water. There's no electricity. There's no bottled water that anybody can purchase. And as you know, Florida has the highest or among the highest elderly populations in the U.S., so getting that uh, those basic resources back on is an absolute necessity, Chuck. Yeah, I think Charlotte County has something like nearly 50% of its populations over the age of 65. So we have a lot, yeah. a lot of seniors to be getting bottled water to and resources to ASAP. Blaine Alexander on the ground force in Fort Myers. Blaine, thank you. Our coverage, our team coverage of Hurricane Ian continues next. We'll have NBC News meteorologist Bill Cairns here. We'll speak with an official from one of the most devastated counties in Florida about the recovery efforts there. You're watching Meet the Press now.
Welcome back. We continue to track what is left of Hurricane Ian. It made landfall just two hours ago again, this time in South Carolina. President Biden has already approved emergency declarations for South Carolina and Florida. Georgia's governor has also declared a state of emergency. I believe Virginia's governor has as well. But to give you a sense of the size of Ian, the bands of this storm, believe it or not, stretch from Georgia to New England. The all of the original 13 colonies. NBC meteorologist Bill Karens has the latest. So, Bill, uh, you like that 13 colon colonies I reference. I see that. That was good. All right. <laughs> I wasn't ready for that. Uh, tell me where we're headed here, and, and I hope tell people in the mid-Atlantic that this thing's not going to sit on them and drop rain on them for the next three days. Yeah, as long as it keeps moving, we're a lot better off, and yeah. that's all about the rain. So we went into today with, you know, this is a life-threatening situation. It's a Category 1 storm making landfall. You worry about the storm surge. You worry about trees falling on houses and people and cars. And then, of course, you worry about the flash flooding. So the storm surge portion of the storm is over with. We know that in the Myrtle Beach area, southwards down to Georgetown, where we made landfall, this was the second highest storm surge they ever recorded. So we had some serious water problems. There were water rescues. A lot of that area is kind of built, though, for this. A lot of houses are up on stilts, so we're hoping we don't have too much damage into homes. So we'll find that out probably tomorrow morning. And this is the last moments that this is going to be a hurricane, by the way. Winds are at about 85 miles per hour. Uh, it's going to head northwards at about 15. You were mentioning that rain shield, and that continues all the way up now to Richmond, the Norfolk, and it's going to head up into the New York City area tonight. The highest wind gust that we had was about 92 miles per hour. So that's a pretty significant, crazy wind. So we are going to see tomorrow when we get the pictures in from the Charleston area, there's going to be a lot of wind damage in the Charleston area. And then as far as what we're going to deal with, as far as flash flooding goes, we're really concerned with what happens. This heavy rain band right now located over Columbia, that's setting up over the Charlotte area. And that may sit there right through the evening rush hour into tonight. Mm. That could quickly drop about six inches of rain. So that's one concern with it. And then, of course, you know, Chuck, you've probably been down here to the, you know, Norfolk, the Hampton Roads yep. area there. They always flood. I mean, they yes. get nor'easters, they get flooding. And so there's flash flood warnings all through that region let yeah, me tell ahead. you i'm curious at, at this point how the the other issue that happens with these hurricanes as they sort of trickle north is that even though the wind is 50 to 60 miles an hour <laughs> we got more trees up here that haven't been through 50 and 60 miles an hour i mean how how much inland how much of the do you expect that those strong of winds for yeah. the virginias the maryland's the tennessee's as it keeps marching north well, so far, that hasn't materialized. So we were really concerned with the heavy rain. So it gets mm -hmm. into the soil. You know, the roots aren't holding on as tight as they would. And then you get those winds on top of it. Right now, we're sitting at like 100, 120,000 people without power in South Carolina. You know, that number you'd think with a Category 1 hurricane making limpo would be a little bit worse. But, you know, the highest winds really avoided areas south of Charleston. And inland, we haven't seen it yet. So I know a lot of people in Charlotte and Raleigh, Winston-Salem, right. Greensboro, they're all wondering in Fayetteville, are we going to lose our power? Hour tonight, I think it'll be isolated. I don't think we're seeing wind gusts 40 to 50 miles per hour, and that'll probably even trickle up to Richmond and D.C. later on tonight. But uh, it doesn't look like this is going to be a multi like million people yeah. without power. So, uh, you, you know, I'd say about 99.5 percent of the damage from this hurricane has already been done. That is, I guess we can call that good news at yeah. this point. Uh, Let's get at it least over there's with. not bad news going forward. Bill Karen. Right. Uh, what a week for you, sir. Yeah. Uh, I hope you do get some rest uh, thank you. this weekend. So thank you. I'm joined now by Charlotte County Commissioner Bill Truex. And we were talking about the damage in Charlotte County. And, and Mr. Truex, I was talking about the fact your population, you have a high elderly population. So I want to talk about what my reporter was just telling me a few minutes ago about just simply getting some bottled water in and things like that. Tell me how those recovery efforts are going. Well, the, those missions are still underway. Unfortunately, we uh, do have several trailers uh, of MREs that come in mm -hmm. to help assist in feeding people in an emergent situation. We have an organization coming in on Sunday that um, will be able to gear up to feed 50,000 people per day. Our population is 62% over the age of 65. Okay, and we had over 300 uh, backlogged 911 calls that we could not respond to until the winds had subsided. Wow. So there's a lot of work out there now with strike teams doing damage assessment, making sure they're going door to door, uh, trying to locate people. We had 31 people on Little Gasper Little Island that, just, that chose not to leave. Fortunately, we did not get the storm surge that they got down in Lee County, because if we'd have gotten that, I would imagine that those 31 souls very possibly could have been um, fatalities. 
Yeah. We do have 12 fatalities, as I understand it, in Charlotte County now. Some of them are storm-related. Some of them don't appear to be. We still haven't got conclusions from the ME's office just yet. That's kind of where we are now. You can see the video in front of you. Yeah. There are no you just did a helicopter things. tour. I mean, just could you recognize how, how unrecognizable were things to you? It's amazing. I've been there 31 years, and I'm up in the air trying to figure out where I'm at um, in many cases. Now, when I came in from the water, I knew certain areas, and I know certain landmarks from the sky, but it was difficult. Um, I, I couldn't even find my own house, to be honest, because we flew over it, wow. and uh, I had a very difficult time identifying, oh, there's mine back there. Wow. Uh, it, it, it's a mess. Uh, uh, I live in an area called Rotunda, and Ireland was in my section. It looks like a war zone there. Uh, the all manufactured mobile housing um, is virtually demolished uh, in this county, uh, particularly in West County. I saw myself uh, from that tour, but um, it, it's true devastation. I was here for Charlie. I was here for Irma, and um, I will tell you that this is a Charlie that is just hit the entire community. Uh, it was much broader, as you just indicated. Even still, the bands are expanding very far from the center of the eye. And um, we actually dodged a bullet. Um, I tell people we're blessed because we wow. did not get the... Yeah. No, I, I, it, I take your point on the, on the water issue. Let me ask you this. With the, uh, with the issue of you have an elderly population in this county, power... There are many folks need power uh, for, for medical supplies and things like that. What's the status of power in the county? Uh, the status of power, we started with 100% loss of power. Um, as of this morning, we were at 16% restored. I don't know. They're doing the briefing right now, 4 o'clock. They started. Uh, I don't know where we are. We're a long road away from being able to get powers to many, power to many neighborhoods because the transmission lines um, have been affected. There's some lines down still in West County. There's a lot of poles bent on a lot of the main runs or leaning that have to be shored up before, you know, they can get power to the neighborhoods. We could be looking at, um, I'm, I'm hoping we have 50% by, you know, Wednesday or Thursday of next week. Um, but that may be an ambitious goal at this point. Yeah, people are going to have to prepare for weeks. Let me ask you this. You talked about uh, the, manufa the, the uh, manufactured housing didn't hold up very well. Um, what's a lesson you're going to take away from this when it comes to the rebuild? Well, Chuck, it's a great, it's a great question. I'm a building contractor. I own a construction company. That's my, my other job. And the, so many things that we see, some of the older construction obviously doesn't hold up as well as the newer codes do. I mean, the things that are built under new codes that have been perfected year after year after year with the uh, lessons that we have learned from Michael mm -hmm. and from Irma, we continue to put that science back into to building and it will make a difference. I can tell you that it was obvious to me in the air that shingles aren't a very good option in Florida. Nope. It's a more affordable option. Mine held together pretty well for being 18 years old, but the metal roofs, they really, under the new code, really seem to hold up very, very well. The tile did as well, uh, as long as no projectiles hit it. So right. there's a lot to learn from this storm. Uh, there's a lot that was learned from Irma, and I will tell you, FEMA is on the ground here. I've got to thank uh, President Biden. I've gotten a couple calls from the White House, uh, from staff there. They're mm -hmm. very uh, interested and concerned. Uh, the governor has taken a notice and has been here. Um, our CFO is helping us to set up an insurance village to help the citizens of our community. And um, yeah. Senator Scott was here earlier just thanking all the first responders and the people. Our team here locally on the ground is phenomenal. Our sheriff's office, all those employees, our Charlotte County Fire EMS folks, all our triage people, the staff in the EOC, they're working tirelessly to try to make certain that our residents get yeah. back on track as well, look, I, 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 I'm glad we could bring some attention to what's going on in Charlotte County. This is something, again, you have an older population. When, when we talk about recovery efforts, I think about Charlotte County almost first and foremost right now. Uh, Bill Truix, thanks for uh, sharing the situation with us. Thank you, Chuck. Appreciate it. You got it. Still ahead, we're going to move globally. Vladimir Putin makes possibly his most vitriolic statement ever against the West. And, of course, we're going to continue our coverage of Hurricane Ian as the Carolina coast deals with flooding uh, from the rain, high winds, and some dangerous storm surge. You're watching Meet the Press now.
Welcome back. In the latest escalation of the war in Ukraine, Vladimir Putin formally announced today that Russia has illegally annexed four Ukrainian territories. Of course, he didn't say they illegally annexed them, but the rest of the world did. He said the people of those regions will become Russian citizens forever. Even by Putin's standards, the speech he delivered today was especially vitriolic and antagonistic. He railed against the West as the, quote, enemy. In response to Russia's illegal annexation, the Biden administration announced a slew of sanctions targeting Russia's defense and technology sectors, as well as a number of top Russian officials. Biden issued this stark warning to Putin today. America is fully prepared, prepared with our NATO allies to defend every single inch of NATO territory. Every single inch. So, Mr. Putin, don't misunderstand what I'm saying. Every inch. Every inch. Does every inch include an attack on a pipeline? Just hours after Putin's speech, President Zelensky announced his country has submitted what he called an accelerated application to join NATO. Meanwhile, on the battlefield, Ukrainian officials are blaming Russia for an attack on a civilian convoy outside the city of Zaporizhia. Uh, that's, of course, where that uh, nuclear power plant is. Officials there say uh, this attack killed 30 people, including two children. 88 others were hospitalized. And now we're going to go out to London, where Keir Simmons has more on what it is that Putin may be thinking right now. Views about guns can vary widely depending on where you are. For example, I'm here right now in suburban Baltimore, and the views here are very different than the views in a place like where I am now, in downtown Baltimore, a place where the murder rate this year is outpacing that of last year. I realized it, it was really a, a stress reliever. Like, I was having kids, like, really coming in there, wanting to fight everyone. Alex Long, a community activist who's lost family members to gun violence, has decided to open a gym to try to lure kids off the streets and away from guns. And by the time they left, they literally would come to me and like, man, if I wasn't doing this, I'd probably get locked up. In a city with more than 240 homicides so far this year, guns here are easy to get. 13, 14-year-olds that will have access and it's deliberate. Like I say, guys will come around here with cars and trucks full of firearms, and the purpose is target our youth. Where are our leaders to tackle you this issue? Because these are our kids. These aren't some war-torn country or a bunch of soldiers that have been heavenly trained. These are our kids, and we turned our back on them. So that's our fault. You know, so our kids, they, they felt alone. They felt like they have to do it on their own. <clears throat> and sadly, in a lot of cases, I have to agree with them. Well, that was actually Cal Perry. And that was actually, we sort of skipped segments there. That is our um, preview of Meet the Press Reports. Sort of the changing nature of America's gun culture. Who owns a gun these days? Who would, who, who is, what, who are today's gun owners? It's not as uh, stereotyped as you might think. It's a terrific 30 minutes. I hope you, uh, if you want to go on Peacock, you can find it anywhere, YouTube, Peacock, et cetera. Uh, we had expected a report from Keir Simmons on the latest out of the Kremlin. That ended up being a bit of a technical difficulty, so my apologies for that confusion there. But do check out that new episode of Meet the Press Reports, which you can go check out right this instant. Up next, we're going to dive into some of the big changes in recent days in the battle for Senate control. It's gotten a lot more competitive, and the stakes have been raised for some upcoming debates. And we continue to monitor Hurricane Ian as it pounds the Carolina coast. You're watching Meet the Press now. Welcome back. We're actually going to take a break from storm coverage and do a little politics. With just a few hours to spare, the House this afternoon approved a short-term spending package to avoid a government shutdown. Senate signed off on that package yesterday. It contains more than $12 billion in Ukraine aid, and it heads to President Biden's desk. Members did not want to see a shutdown. They wanted to get home to hit the campaign trail. We're now 39 days away. And as we reported in First Read this morning, we've seen some shifting winds in the battle, particularly in the battle for control of the Senate. A boost in Republican spending that was expected has blunted some Democratic momentum in a couple of key Senate races. And while Democrats are weathering the storm in some places like Georgia and Pennsylvania, the big change is in Wisconsin, where Democrat Mandela Barnes has seen Republican incumbent Ron Johnson surge 
in the past couple of weeks. So joining me now on set, Stephen Hayes, editor and CEO of The Dispatch and an NBC News political analyst, Eugene Scott, national political reporter for The Washington Post, and Stephanie Triak, Democratic strategist and senior advisor for the Strategic Victory Fund Super PAC. Uh, Steve, you're a Wisconsin native, so I want to start with you. I feel like we went from a flip favorite to speak in football terms, where yeah. Mandela Barnes looked like a one or two point favorite a month ago, and now Ron Johnson looks like the one or two point favorite. And there's this moment that we're in where even though Barnes is still right there, it feels like he's really taking on water. Yeah, it feels like he's moving. I mean, look, if you go back and you remember the what was to have been the Democratic primary in Wisconsin ended up not being much of a Democratic primary. It sort of cleared the field for for Mandela Barnes. And I think there are moderate Democrats who at the time were, you know, happy to say on background, they didn't love this decision. Um, because Mandela Barnes is pretty far left. And while that can work in Madison mm -hmm. and some other progressive areas of the state, it's not going to work out state. And I think Ron Johnson, as, as, you know, as, as often as he said things that I think yeah. m you know, moderates or independents would regard as crazy, he's been part of the election denial argument uh, now a, a number of times, he's sort of the crazy they know. Yeah. If that makes sense. And and when you contrast him with Barnes, it's it's uh, politically or philosophically not a great contrast. You know, Stephanie, when people look at if Ron Johnson wins, you say, how the heck has he become a three-term senator, right? And then you you will look at, and, you, and, you, and a question's got to be asked. The three time, three races have always been against people from Madison, whether it's Mandela Barnes or twice against Russ Feingold. Madison is not the rest of Wisconsin. Right. And I've talked to some Milwaukee Democrats who said, you know, that was the thing that we're most concerned about. It's not about whether an African-American can win statewide. Can a Madison Democrat win statewide? I don't know. Senator Tammy Baldwin did pretty well out of Madison. So Fair point. <laughs> just let's not forget that. Um, I, I, I've always felt that this race was going to tighten up. You've got a situation with Senator Johnson who said he wasn't going to run again. He is an election denier. This is all going to come back. We knew this mm -hmm. race was going to get nasty. Of course, all these races are getting nasty. Mm -hmm. I mean, we are in the time where all the negative ads are coming in. Right. And, and they've got a really big problem with Johnson. Uh, he's still, I would argue, one of the very most vulnerable incumbents on either side. He's not popular. He's not well liked at all. His numbers are yeah. terrible. Yes. Yeah. And it's a state where you've got also a very close governor's race. So you yeah. have massive turnout. The governor's looking better, moving in the right direction. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of dynamics in that state going on right now. So I think we are far from done. And I think we've got a tight race. And our numbers, I will say, I've, I've got, seen a number of polls that have this. Just, the coin flip. It's just really, really tight. You know, Eugene, one of the things, if, if people are going to backseat drive Mandela Barnes, they're going to say, you know, every hit you're taking on right now is a hit everybody saw coming. Yeah. And he didn't make an attempt to inoculate. The way, for instance, we've seen Fetterman do in different ways. He decided sure. to make Oz, he, gave, he made Oz take on water in August, and he's, I think, handling it well. Warnock took it to Walker early and also tried to inoculate himself. Yeah. Barnes did no, he didn't. I think he really thought that what he was putting forward would be attractive to most of the voters because Johnson is so unpopular, but demographics are what they are. And most registered voters in Wisconsin are actually Republicans. As, you're, as you've noted, most people in uh, Wisconsin do not live in Milwaukee. They do not live in Madison. There are far more rural residents than there are urban residents. Mm -hmm. And the politics that come with those demographics were going to be hard for Mandela to overcome, period, even if he had uh, been more or, you know, aggressive in right. uh, approaching his opponent. And the fact that he wasn't, it's not helping him right now. Stephanie, let's talk about the bigger picture here. A lot of Democrats were quietly warning in Labor Day. And before Democrats get too happy about the midterms taking a new turn, let's see what happens after a month of money. We've had a month of money. Wisconsin is a big one. How else do you think the party's held up? Well, I think the Senate's going to be a very close race. I, I felt that the entire time. What's interesting is this map is completely turning around. Mm -hmm. You've got McConnell basically pulling out of Arizona. Mm -hmm. uh, you've got New Hampshire that everybody, everybody forgets that New Hampshire gets super close in September. You got to, everybody's got to put money in in September. It happens every single cycle. So Senator Hassan, who I'm very confident is going to win this election, but she's going to have to fight for it because it's an independent state. Yeah. But, but then we got really decent polls in Ohio that we never thought we were going to see. Mm -hmm. North Carolina, uh, I think Sherry Beasley's done a phenomenal job there. So you've got this just sort of flipping around. So if you're Mitch McConnell, 
You're like, you got to put all this money, a huge amount of money to save an incumbent yeah. when you need a couple seats. You've got to take out some Democrats. And his map is shifting around on him. Where does he go, right? Wisconsin, he's a, and it seems like they feel like they have to try to fix Pennsylvania. But is there any place else for him to go if New I mean, Hampshire and Arizona are kind of out of touch? It seems like they have play. to try to fix Pennsylvania now. Yeah. I mean, we'll see. We'll, we'll monitor the polls and see what they want to do. Look, I mean, I think the story of, of the election is Republicans nominated a bunch of people who were prime, popular in Republican primaries who are not going to be popular beyond Republican primaries. Yeah. I mean, this isn't that complicated. I think that I if you read everything there is to read about this midterm cycle... There's a, there, there's a lot of uh, sort of analysis that doesn't need to happen. Like, this is pretty simple. Like, Republicans nominated people who are popular with Republicans and unpopular with the rest of the country, the rest of their states. Yeah. And so we'll you're like to see it play out. Yeah. Are you saying candidates, candidates matter? Candidates matter. <laughs> well, if I have I mean, to say actually, candidates you know, matter another but, time. But actually, this, like this is where... Stay away from the election deniers, but, I think is... But more importantly, I mean, Eugene, right I think what we discovered this month is this is an even election. Mm -hmm. Okay, we're not, there isn't going to be, win there's going to be cross currents, mm -hmm. and I've always described it as, since we're going to use these weather analogies, there may be an abortion tornado that hits Arizona and really hurts Republicans mm -hmm. there. There may be a crime tornado that hurts mm -hmm. Democrats in, in Wisconsin, right? It's not going to be uniform. I think that's also the new norm in a lot of races in a lot of states, that they're going to be more tight than we think. Mm -hmm. uh, maybe the years of, like, crazy blowouts are behind us. Because we have a lot of people in America who see things one way and a lot who see things the other way. And everybody's engaged. Yeah, and people are yeah, paying people attention. Are people the are turnout paying attention. is going to be so high here. You're going to mm -hmm. see some really interesting things. But if you're the Republicans, six months ago, you thought you were mm -hmm. absolutely taking the House. You're going to pick up those seats in the Senate. You're going you're to knock off a bunch of Democrat governors. You're six months later. And your coin flips all over the country. Yeah. I mean, that's that's the change, there and that's a lot of that's a lot of abortion will, and Trump. We'll get them. Well, here's another thing to sort of keep in mind is is uh, what I keep hearing about is suddenly there are a whole bunch of safe Republican. I don't want to say safe. They were sort of districts that Republicans thought were safe, where Dobbs is just turning out to be a huge issue. I've heard about two races in Iowa, the two Eastern Iowa districts that Republicans thought they were gonna yeah. were safe, suddenly don't look safe. No, I mean, this was the question. I think you talked to Republican pollsters, talked to Republican strategists early, and they wanted to know, is what they're seeing in the polling post-Dobbs something that was going to be short-term mm -hmm. and then would sort of fall back to a, a sort of a normal state of affairs, or was it going to persist? And I think this, the, the, the recent polling suggests that, that they'll persist. I just think that no one truly factored in that every week yeah. some legislature was going to try to take away abortion access. Yeah. That every week there was going to be another Kept story and another news. story yeah. and another story because they, can't, they are trying to have a national ban and they're going to do it any way they can. That's the problem they have. Uh, so what happens when you listen yeah. to your base and don't pay attention to voters beyond your base? I mean, if you're only paying attention to white evangelical voters, mm -hmm. which if you're a Republican, you have to, you can forget that most voters are not white evangelicals. I want to bring up one race that is, I think conventional wisdom has shifted and that is Georgia governor. And I want to show a devastating ad. I think this is a devastating ad that Kemp is running against her. I want to play a clip of it and get your reaction to it. Here it is. I can't understand why David Valadeo would support a bill making an abortion a crime after a woman or a young girl has been raped. We should be focused on the grown man who raped a young girl instead of punishing the victim of this crime. Talk show, magazine covers, television cameos. Stacey Abrams wants to leave Georgia behind. Abrams' next act? You also see yourself running as president, too. Oh, absolutely. Celebrity Stacey, a perfect governor for liberal elites, just not hardworking Georgians. All right, we ran both of these ads that I wanted to make points about that were kind of separate. Uh, the first one is how Democrats are trying to respond to crime hits by tying it to abortion, the David Valadeo ad. Stephanie, tell me about it. Do you think it's effective? Uh, I do. I do. And I think the Republicans are just, so, I mean, they've already run away from abortion. Mm -hmm. They're scrubbing their sites. They don't want, they want to change the topic so much. Uh, and and the Democrats are are responding. And I guess I, I've I've ran a lot of races against yeah. Neville Day. This is actually I think he's going to lose this one, which is amazing to me. Uh, Celebrity Stacy, it reminded me of the McCain hit on Obama. That one didn't work. This one feels like it hit because 
it just was all about how her she's not in Georgia. Yeah, for sure. I mean, the, the, the Obama argument, I don't think, worked because he was a national candidate. I mean, this was all about national. Mm -hmm. He was certainly a celebrity. Yeah. And, and to, to denigrate him as a celebrity, I think, was a clever approach, but he was already a celebrity. This, I think, works because she's running in Georgia. Yeah, no, it, it was. It is one of those where aftermath, you look at the ad, you're like, oh, it summed up perhaps some of the ways that if she could do the race over, she might do the race over. Uh, Stephen, Stephanie, Eugene. Thank you. Enjoy your Friday. We're keeping an eye on Hurricane Ian as it moves northward after leaving an historic path of destruction. I'm going to talk to uh, one of the uh, nation's best experts on hurricane recoveries, Craig Fugate. That's next. Welcome back. As Hurricane Ian hits the Carolina coast, Florida communities are now picking up the pieces, assessing the damage from the powerful storm's wake. The financial services company CoreLogic estimates that Ian will cost an estimated 28 to $47 billion in uninsured and insured wind and storm damage. It would make it the most costly Florida storm since Hurricane Andrew. Joining me now is someone who knows a little bit about disaster recoveries, former FEMA administrator and, uh, and former director of the Florida Emergency Management Division, Craig Fugate. And so folks know, um, we only have a, f uh, a short time here. Craig, I want to focus on Charlotte County because it's sort of the story that, that I feel like is developing now. This is a county right now that's got an elderly population over 60 percent. And we've got a lot of work to do on water, getting power there. Just talk about the logistical challenges that, they're, that, that FEMA and the Florida emergency folks are facing to help Charlotte County. Well, I'll give you an example. You know, FEMA was moving lots of water, lots of shelf-stable meals, so was the state. And the National Guard is already setting up points of distribution. Uh, we, we've learned this lesson all the way back to Hurricane Andrew. But we're also working with the private sector. You know, a lot of these stores used to be closed when the power goes out. Well, they got generators. So, you know, chains like Publix, they've been making big investments to get their stores back up after mm. disasters. And so the combination of the private sector getting back online, FEMA working with the state to fill the gaps, and getting those types of services in the areas where people are still at as they continue search and rescue operations. I also want to talk to you about something that the uh, Charlotte County uh, emergency manager told us. He said he saw a lot of flattened manufactured homes. And, you know, the homes that are manufactured somewhere else and put down. I got to ask you, Craig, how long can the state of Florida allow homes like that to be built? You know, manufactured housing is something that's regulated by HUD. They have to meet these standards. Uh, but again, we're seeing in these really high wind events uh, how they're performing. So I think this is going to be similar to Andrew. There's going to be a lot of questions about what we do in Florida and what we need to do differently when we build back. Because building back the way it was just leads to a future disaster. And we get into this a little bit longer on my podcast earlier today. But another challenge coming in the in the I think the next couple of years is going to be convincing insurance companies to come back to the state. Don't leave the state. What can the state do right now to try to stop it? Well, I think the thing is you got to create insurable risk. That means you got to build back in a way that makes sense for insurance companies to invest in that risk. I mean, everybody's going to treat the insurance companies as bad people because they're leaving. And I remind people, they have the money of investors that invest in this. And if they can't protect that money and they can't generate a profit, they got to leave. And it's not in their interest. They make money when they sell insurance, mm -hmm. not when they leave markets. But it means you got to make sure what you build back is insurable. Can you explain how this, I mean, the state of Florida basically is now, it's, is now an insurance company. How long, is that sustainable? Well, you know, this goes all the way back to Andrew. When we lost insurance companies then, we created the CAT fund, the reinsurance fund that Florida runs for insurance companies. Ultimately, be, you know, we became the insurer of last resort and citizens. But now citizens is the insurer of major, you know, is the primary coverage for a lot of areas. And the challenge with that is they have the ability to issue bonds based upon the authority to put additional surcharges on everybody's insurance policies, even those that weren't impacted. So that will be the question of how much does this cost? Can right. they raise the funds? Interest rates are going up. This is going to cost more to borrow this money to pay all these claims out. So you expect Citizen is going to have to borrow money to pay out. They, they, didn't, they don't have enough in, the, in their account to, to avoid that. I don't know yet, but that's what the plan is. They will have their reserves, they have their reinsurance, and then they have the ability to go out and borrow money and issue bonds yeah. to make their payments 
based upon putting surcharges on other policies. Well, uh, Florida likes to balance its budget every year. This could be a real challenge as this uh, state-run insurance company only grows in liability. Craig Fugate, the former FEMA director, thank you. And if you want more Craig Fugate, I'm going to give you more Craig Fugate. The latest episode of the Chuck Toddcast, take a listen, get it wherever you get your podcast. And if it's Sunday, it's Meet the Press on your local NBC station. i got a packed show. Florida Senator and former Governor Rick Scott will be among my guests. I'll also have the governor of North Carolina on as well. we got a brand-new NBC News Telemundo poll. And, oh, by the way, the head of NATO. Don't miss it. It's a big show. Thanks for watching our YouTube channel. Follow today's top stories and breaking news by downloading the NBC News app.